All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk specifically about the mechanics of muscle or muscle mechanics. All right, so if you guys have watched our videos on skeletal muscle contraction, you guys have seen part one and part two and part three and all the aspects of the, how the muscle is contracting. And also, if you guys have watched the actual muscle fiber types, that's also going to help you in this video as well. So the main topic of this video is we're going to be talking about graded muscle responses. Okay, what, what do I mean by that? So what is, first off, let's write down over here, what is a graded muscle response and what does it depend upon? So a graded muscle response is basically how the muscle cell responds to two different types of stimuli. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So there's two main types of stimuli that can produce these graded potentials, these graded responses within muscle cells. In other words, trying to bring the muscle cell from resting membrane potential to a threshold potential. All right, so those two stimuli is depending upon the frequency. So it depends upon the frequency of neural stimuli, because that's mainly a, uh, the way that these skeletal muscle fibers are stimulated. Our skeletal muscle fibers are mainly stimulated based upon neural stimuli, primarily the somatic nervous system via the, the um, nicotinic receptors from acetylcholine. The other thing that determines the actual graded muscle response is the actual strength of the neural stimuli. So the frequency of the neural stimuli affects the graded response and the strength of the neural stimuli is also another important effector of graded responses. Now before I get into depth about graded responses, I want to talk about something else really quick. And it's, there are two uh, things that I'm going to talk about are in relation to one another. I want to talk about first what is referred to as a muscle twitch. What is a muscle twitch? Okay, that's the first thing I want to talk about. And then after that, we're going to relate a muscle twitch to motor unit, okay? For right now, I'm going to define what these two terms are meant, okay? What they mean by these two terms. A muscle twitch, right, is a muscle contraction. It's a very, very brief and rapid contraction of a muscle in response to a single neural stimulus. That is what a muscle twitch is. So, here, let's write that down, just so you guys have that. So a muscle twitch is what? It's a contraction rapid contraction of muscle from one, okay, I'm going to put like a little starring around that, one neural stimulus. Okay, that is what is meant by a muscle twitch. It's a rapid contraction of a muscle from one neural stimulus. Um, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was a motor unit, and we'll, just, we'll talk about these in great detail, but a motor unit is by definition, I like to make it like a mathematical equation, it's a motor neuron plus, so a motor unit equals the motor neuron plus muscle fibers that motor neuron supplies. So muscle fibers supplied by that motor neuron that together makes up a motor unit. So I just wanted to get these terms, just the quick definitions and explanations of these terms, because now we're going to go into depth and explain what all of these things are. So again, a graded response is dependent upon two things. And we can, we can say a graded response is a graded potential. It just means you're trying to take the resting membrane potential of a muscle cell, which is normally negative 90, negative 80, negative 90 millivolts, and bring it to threshold, okay? And that's about negative 55. How do we do that? It depends upon the frequency of the neural stimulus, and it depends upon the strength of the neural stimulus. We'll also talk about what's called a maximal threshold. Okay, we'll talk about that too. Muscle twitch is a rapid contraction of a skeletal muscle in response to one neural stimulus, just a really rapid contraction. And a motor unit is a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it supplies. Okay, now that we got these definitions out of the way, let's go ahead and start talking about this stuff. First thing I wanna talk about is a muscle twitch. I wanna talk about the phases of a muscle twitch. So, if you look here, you guys probably have already seen the structure of skeletal muscle video. We basically took a whole muscle belly, broke it up right here, and then you have a big old, here's the muscle belly cross section, and all of these structures here are fascicles. If you remember that these, this big bundle right here that we're just blowing up one, this is an example of a fascicle, right? And a fascicle is surrounded by a connective tissue we talked about called perimysium. And then that fascicle consists of bundles of muscle fibers or muscle cells, which each individual one is wrapped by endomysium. 
what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how these muscle fibers are actually contracting with response to that twitch. Let's say, I, let's okay, for example, in a muscle cell it has three phases. Let's mark out those three phases. One phase is the latent phase, okay, the latent phase. The second one is the contraction phase. And the third one is the relaxation phase or the refractory phase, okay? So for example, the latent phase. The latent phase is, let's say that I actually, if you guys uh, remember, let's say here that I have my actin, okay, my, all my thin filaments, right? So here's my actin, and there's the little pockets, right? And if you guys remember, let's pretend for a second that this is myosin, okay? Here's my thick filament, which consists of my myosin heads right if you guys remember whenever these guys the myosin and the actin interact with one another that's the cross bridge formation we're going to start the sliding filament theory well let's say for that brief period in time it's very 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 brief okay but it can differ based upon different types of skeletal muscle fibers depending upon their location what they're designed to do but generally whenever a muscle cell is getting ready to contract the cross bridges are activated but the myosin is starting to get ready to move the thin filaments, but it hasn't started to move them yet. There hasn't been any sliding occurring, okay? No sliding has occurred yet, but the myosin and the actin are connected with one another. That is the key thing. There is a myosin-actin interaction in this latent phase, but there's no power stroke, there's no movement, there's no sliding, there's no shortening of the actual muscle fiber. So therefore, if you were to look on this graph, let's say on this graph we have x, x axis here, which is time in milliseconds. On the y axis we have tension. What did I say? The cross bridges are active, right? But they're not starting to shorten the skeletal muscle. So will there be any tension? Not really. There might be a tiny, tiny bit of tension, but there's not going to be anything significant. So in other words, we're going to see almost a straight line. Okay, a straight line or a plateaued line, which means that there's almost no tension being developed. Or the tension is remaining constant at zero, let's say. Or we, if we want to, we can say that it develops a tiny bit of tension. Let's say it's like five, okay? So it's like five, you know, newtons in this case. So if we're talking about tension in the form of force, right? Let's talk, let's say it's in that case. But then, what happens in the skeletal muscle? You guys remember that we had that sarcoplasmic reticulum? Let's just say here's our sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here's another sarcoplasmic reticulum, and you know in between the sarcoplasmic reticulums, you have the T-tubule, and here's your muscle cell membrane, right? Let's say for a second that you stimulate this muscle cell. You provide a neural stimulus. So here's a neural stimulus. Neural stimulus activates voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium starts flushing in, right? When the sodium starts flushing in, it causes an action potential across the actual sarcolemma, which stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to produce calcium and put it out here into the sarcoplasm. When the calcium is out here, it'll actually bind onto that protein. What is that protein called? It'll bind onto troponin. And troponin will change the shape of the actual tropomyosin. And it'll lead to the myosin acting, uh, binding to the actin. That's what's happening into the latent phase, right? So that's happening in the latent phase. But in the contraction phase, what's different? Now the myosin heads are actually moving. Now it's creating power strokes. If it's creating these power strokes, what's going to start happening to this actual thin filament? It's going to start moving, 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 moving closer to the actual M line, remember? So you have the M line right down the middle of the sarcomere. These thin filaments, if they're moving closer and closer and closer towards the M line, aren't they actually, isn't the muscle fiber shortening then? Aren't the I bands getting smaller? Isn't the H zone getting smaller? Isn't the Z disc getting pulled closer together? So the muscle fiber should actually be getting to shorten. If it starts shortening, what is it beginning to develop? Tension. And that is when you develop this actual high amount of tension. So let's say here, this is the latent phase. But then, we're going to do it in this color, it actually starts to develop this actual tension because now the cross bridges between actin and myosin are very active. And they're starting to move. Remember, just briefly, if you pretend I was the uh, myosin, here's the actin. So remember, whenever ATP binds, what happens to the myosin? It detaches. Then it hydrolyzes it. Then what happens? It gets cocked back. Let's say here's another actin. What happens? 
after it actually uh, hydrolyzes that ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate, it cocks back and then reattaches to that one. Then what does it do? It releases the phosphate and it creates another power stroke. And that event keeps happening. In the latent phase, it's stuck here. It's not moving it. It's getting ready to. In the contraction phase, it's moving it, detaching, coming back, and attaching to another one. Okay? So that's how it's developing this tension. So you're going to see a rise in the tension. Okay? This phase is the contractile phase or the contraction phase. So we'll say this is the second phase. Can't even see that too. I'm sorry. Let me fix that, guys. That is the contraction phase. And this is the laden phase. OK. Now, if you guys remember, remember uh, whenever the muscle was done contracting, it reached a peak potential of about positive 30 millivolts? So let's say that it reaches a maximal tension here, right? OK. And it reaches its point of maximal voltage, so positive 30 millivolts. If it reaches that positive 30 millivolts, what did that do to the potassium channels? Remember, it activated the activation gates and opened up the channels for potassium ions to start leaving the cell? What else happened? Do you guys remember that we started pushing some of the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? And if we start pushing that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the calcium proton ATPases or the calcium sodium exchangers, we're getting it back in. So now the calcium is starting to be released. The potassium is starting to go out. What's happening to the muscle cell? It's starting to relax. The cross bridges are becoming inactive. If the cross bridges are becoming inactive, then what's going to happen to the tension? It's going to decrease. So now, look at this graph. I'm going to draw the end part of the graph with green. Look what happens to it. It goes back down. And this is the actual relaxation phase, or the repolarization phase. And again, this is the third phase. And what does that do to? That's due to two things. The potassium ions leaving from the cell, as well as the calcium going back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that the cross bridges become inactive. And then if the cross bridges are inactive, they're not having power strokes, they're not moving the myofilaments, there's no sliding of the myofilaments occurring, so therefore tension decreases. But then what happens after the tension decreases? It goes back into the latent period, okay? And we start the whole cycle all over again. This is referred to as the actual, this is going over the events of a muscle twitch. This is going over the events of a single muscle twitch. Okay, due to a single neural stimulus. So these are the phases of a muscle twitch. Again, the latent phase is the cross bridges are actually, you know, are happening. There is a cross bridge between the actin and the myosin, but they're not moving. Contraction phases, they are moving the actin. There is sliding of the myofilaments. There is shortening of the muscle. There is tension developing. And the relaxation phase is when the calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, potassium goes out of the cell, and the cross bridges become inactive and tension starts decreasing. And then it goes into relaxation. Okay, so that's our muscle twitch. But one thing I want to mention to you guys is, you know what's really interesting? This is, on, on average, we're going to say on average, this contraction phase, it technically can occur from a range. Um, so from here to here, so this is about the point here. Let's say I come down here and I make this point here. That point there is usually only about 10. It can range from 10 to 100 milliseconds, OK? This one right here, from this point here to this point here, so from about that point there to about this point here, right? This one can range also from about 10 to 100 milliseconds. However, if you notice, doesn't the relaxation period appear longer than the actual contraction phase, it is. And the reason I said it can occur from 10 to 100 milliseconds for the contraction phase, it depends upon the muscle. So for example, let's say I take my superior rectus muscle. You know superior rectus, it helps me lift up my eyeballs and stuff like that, it helps to elevate them. That muscle has to contract very, very rapidly and very fast. So what do you think his contraction phase would be? Would it be a short window or a very long window? It'd be a very short window, right? So for example, I'm just giving an example. If I were to say the extraocular muscles, so the extraocular muscles. Man, I couldn't even spell extra. Sorry, guys. Extraocular muscles. Those would have a very fast contraction phase. So fast contraction phase. So they'd be significantly low, maybe only 10 milliseconds. Let's say I take, for example, the gastrocnemius muscle. The gastrocnemius muscle, he has to carry a lot of load. 
So it might take a longer time for him to have to be able to lift that load, for it to contract that load. So the actual contraction phase might be a little longer. But now compare that to the soleus muscle. The soleus muscle is right near the gastrocnemius, but it has to carry a significant amount of load. So therefore, the contraction phase for it would be a lot, lot longer. So that's why I wanted to, that way if some of you might be confused, like, oh, Zach, the contraction phase looks like it's a lot shorter than the relaxation phase. It is, but it depends upon the actual muscle fiber. So for example, an extraocular, this would be very narrow. But in something like the soleus, if I already give, for example, the soleus muscle, it's a very slow contraction phase. So in other words, imagine this peak here going a lot longer this way. Okay, so it would actually come a lot longer this way. It wouldn't stop here at this point, it might even go a little bit farther, and then relax. Okay, so I just wanted to explain that. So again, remember the extraocular muscles contract very fast, so they have a very, very short contraction phase, whereas the soleus is a very weight-bearing muscle. It's gonna have a very long contraction phase. Okay, now that we've talked about the muscle twitch, let's go ahead and talk about this next thing, which is the graded muscle responses. All right, so stick with me for a little bit here. This is Kind of a tough topic, but we're gonna do the best we can here in engineer science to help you guys out. Okay, so first off, let's talk about the frequency of a neural stimulus. So let's say here, we come over here to this edge. And here I have a muscle fiber. Just a really crude diagram, nothing crazy. If you see here, we have a skeletal muscle fiber, so just a muscle cell, okay? What happens is, this is our neuron. So the, let's say that we have two neurons. So we'll call this one neuron one, Okay, neuron number one. And we'll call this one up here, let's do this one in uh, this color here. We'll call this one up here neuron number two. Okay, so let's say first thing happens. We wanna contract this muscle fiber, okay? We wanna contract it. This neuron is gonna have an action potential. And it's gonna send these action potentials down its axon. You guys know that, it sends it down the axon. When it sends it down the axon, it triggers the synaptic bulb to release a very potent neurotransmitter, mainly that of acetylcholine, ACH. We're not gonna go into the whole mechanism here, but you guys know that ACH stimulates this muscle cell by developing what? First, it develops end plate potentials, right? So it activates those nicotinic receptors and causes small, small amount of sodium ion influx, less potassium efflux brings it to threshold. Once it brings it to threshold, what's the second thing to happen? An action potential. And then, after the action potential, what happens during that point there? Calcium is released. From where? The sarcoplasmic reticulum. So let's kind of follow this real event really quick. Let's say here's it stimulates it. Positive charge is moving along the sarcolemma, and then it moves down the T-tubules you guys remember, it activates the dihydropyridine receptor, which activates the ryanidine receptor, and pushes the calcium out. What happens to that calcium? It goes over here and assists in the cross bridge formation, right? To activate the cross bridge, to allow for the muscles to slide, to produce tension. So, the third event is cross bridge activation, right? And then what happens? Muscle contracts. And if, you know, there's, a, there's the term load, then there's the term resistance, you know. Let's say that I have a load. Let's make this really, really simple. Let's say I have a load. I'm trying to be able to curl dumbbells, right? I'm trying to be able to curl dumbbells. If the dumbbells, the load, it, it actually has more resistance than I can provide force. So force is I'm trying to contract the muscle, I'm trying to shorten it, right, Den tension. If the load is really, really heavy and it's giving me a lot of resistance to lift it, will I be able to lift that load? No. If the, if the load is heavier than the amount of force that I can exert, I won't be able to lift the load, okay? So now, in this situation, if that happens, if the load is greater, load or the resistance is greater than the amount of force that my muscles can exert to move the load, the muscle will not shorten. But, let's say, for example, that the load is a lot less. Okay, the load is a lot less and it doesn't give as much resistance and my muscle can contract and generate enough force to actually shorten the muscle. Now, that would lead to this actual isotonic contraction, right? So isotonic is whenever you're shortening it, so it's concentric, and if it's lengthening, it's eccentric. And then you have isometric whenever the load is way, way, way too heavy. And if the load is way too heavy and you aren't able to actually shorten the muscle, it's called an isometric contraction. We'll talk about that in another video. 
I just wanted to introduce the concept there. So in general, the muscle will contract. The fourth step would be contraction. But again, the type of contraction depends upon the load and the resistance and this term force, right? Or tension. Sometimes you might hear it as tension a lot. So tension is force. So now, if that happens, that's great. What will we see on the graph if that was the case? So let's say that we, we actually come here and this neuron, it actually activates this guy. What will we see on the graph, neuron number one wise? So let's say here, neuron number one tries to stimulate this guy. So let's say here we have a time, let's say at time 10. So 10 milliseconds, right? I provide a stimulus from neuron number one. If I provide a stimulus for neuron number one, what's gonna happen? Let's just make it simple. Well, first off, where is the muscle cell generally? Generally, when you're looking at a muscle cell, it's usually at resting membrane potential, right? But if I hit it with a stimulus, let's say it actually brings it to threshold. If I bring it to threshold potential, what will happen? It'll generate an action potential. If I generate an action potential, what will happen to the muscle? It'll contract. So let's say here, I actually see this event. I actually have this point here. Let's say here is the, I make like this actual horizontal azimuthal here. And that dotted line is maximal tension. You can't go beyond this point. That's the maximum amount of tension that this muscle fiber can exert. Okay, so this is the maximal tension point. Okay, so now if I deliver a stimulus, that's the first electrical stimulus. So let's say this is from neuron one. Okay, neuron number one. If I deliver that stimulus and it reaches, causes an in-play potential, leads to an action potential, the action potential causes the cross bridge formation, right, to be active, and then leads to contraction. It's gonna generate tension as long as the actual, well, no matter what, it's gonna generate tension, whether it's actually going to be isometric or isotonic. But look what happens. Let's say the first one, it actually doesn't reach anywhere near the maximal tension point. So it gets up to that point, and then it starts getting ready to repolarize. So here, again, what happens here, this is the, let's say they have a latent phase, so here the latent phase, and here is the actual contraction phase, and then it starts getting ready to repolarize. So what is happening during that repolarization period? The calcium starts getting pushed back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? So this is the neuron stimulus number one, okay? So let's come back to this muscle cell for a second. So first thing that happened, we stimulated this muscle cell to begin to contract, right? And now it's at the point now, where is it in that actual point here? We're at the point now we're pushing the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And on the membrane, you have these potassium channels, right? Let's say that the potassium channels are still closed yet, okay? So they haven't been activated yet. We're not at that point where the potassium channels have opened. Let's say that we're at this point where some of the calcium is getting pushed back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let's say at that very moment, that brief moment in time, neuron number two decides to fire. If neuron number two decides to fire and it releases more acetylcholine, and acetylcholine activates this muscle cell, generates a in-play potential, generates an action potential, and calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what will happen? Okay, so let's say it generates a little bit of a action potential here, and what it does is it pushes out a little bit more calcium. So it scores out a little bit more calcium. So some of the calcium is getting pumped back in. What he decides to do is slow down that process and push some of the calcium out. So if some of the calcium is going out again and very little of it is actually getting pushed back in, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna have cross bridge activation. But we already have cross bridge activation slightly, right? It hasn't gone into a, it hasn't repolarized yet. It hasn't relaxed yet. So there still is a minimal amount of tension that we developed if you look from the graph. We haven't gone to full repolarization because if you hit repolarization, the muscle cannot be stimulated. You have to remember that. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. If the potassium channels open, the potassium starts leaking out, repolarization begins. No matter even if that neuron provides a stimulus, you cannot take it out of repolarization. You have to obey the refractory period. But if it's pushing the calcium back into the SR and the potassium channels haven't opened up yet and you haven't pushed the potassium out, you can provide a second neural stimulus and push more calcium out. If more calcium is pushed out, it'll actually generate enhanced, an enhanced cross bridge activation. So let's say for example, so again, it'll increase your actual, it'll enhance the cross bridge activation and it'll increase the contraction, which will increase the tension. We'll talk about that in a second. Think about it like this. Let's say that I have, 
the myosin and the actin heads, right? They're activated. So the myosin and the actin heads are actually moving, right? So let's say that the myosin and the actin, again, let's pretend I'm the myosin, this is the, my hand is the actin. Let's say that again, they're contracting, they're contracting really hard. So again, what happens? ATP, I detach, I cock it when I hydrolyze it, I remove into the next uh, actin and slide that one. And I keep sliding it. Well, let's say that I start to actually reach this point where my muscle is going to relax, getting ready to it, hasn't relaxed yet. And I give more calcium. If I give more calcium, what's going to happen? It's going to enhance that cross bridge formations even more. And I'm going to have more activation. I'm going to keep moving that actin across the actual myosin, right? And what's going to happen? The muscle is going to shorten even more. If the muscle shortens even more, doesn't it develop more tension? Yes. So think about that. Whenever you're trying to be able to lift something like a heavier load, your neuron, neurons can provide f very, very frequent and consistent excitatory stimuli, subsequent stimuli. And if it does that, it can cause the contraction. The second stimulus can cause an even more powerful contraction than the first. So let's come over here and explain it on this graph now. Okay. So it's at this point. It's at that peak tension point for that, that stimulus. But then it's getting ready to. It hasn't repolarized yet, but it's getting ready to. And what did we do? Let's say here at, and we're just hypothesizing these times. Let's say it's at, uh, happens to be at about 30 milliseconds, whatever, okay? And it comes over and you give this second stimulus. So this is from neuron number two, okay? What will happen? Okay, well then this guy, he's going to enhance the actual tension from that point, because that's what we said. We said he'll cause the action potential, he'll cause more calcium to get released, He'll cause more cross bridges to get activated, so it'll increase the cross bridge activation and enhance the contraction, which will increase the tension. So what should we see? We should see this curve going up even more. But then let's say that this one, again, it doesn't reach maximal tension. It starts getting ready to drop also. And let's say, for example, just for the heck of it, I have neuron number three, and it releases acetylcholine. And if it releases acetylcholine, it stimulates this guy, causes the action potential. If it causes the action potential, causes more calcium to get released. The more calcium that gets released, the more cross bridge activation is enhanced, and the more contraction is enhanced, and the more tension we develop. It's so simple, right? So again, at this point here, what will happen? Let's say that this is at time 50 milliseconds. And this is going to be a stimulus from neuron number three. What will happen? It'll start getting ready to repolarize, but the potassium channels didn't open, repolarization hasn't begun, only calcium starting to get pushed back into the SR, but we blast more of that, that actual what? Calcium out and enhance the cross bridge formations and enhance contraction, which increases tension. And let's say that we reach that maximal tension point. And then at that point, let's say that the muscle has reached maximal tension, it doesn't want to contract anymore, there's not any more neural stimulus, and it has to relax, what will happen? It'll go into its relaxation state and eventually wait for another neural stimulus. And when it receives another neural stimulus, it'll again perform the same action. Okay, so in this graph over here to the actual left, what we did, the first one, that was just one single muscle twitch due to one single neural stimulus. But if you provide very, very frequent neural stimuli, what can happen? So in this one, look at this one here. We only provided one neural stimulus, so it only had one contraction, one relaxation phase. But what we did in this one is we hit it at that point before the potassium channel started opening. Well, all that was happening is some of the calcium was starting to get pushed back in. So we, when we hit it at that point again, we allowed for it to ride on the shoulders of that first action potential. So that's what's happening. And whenever you see this summation of waves, huh, that's a special word I want you guys to remember, special summation of these waves, we call this event here temporal, and they, do you even call it, or wave summation, okay? So temporal or wave summation is this activity whenever you're having, again, you're providing multiple frequent stimuli causing the actual potential to occur in one stimulus. The second stimulus will ride on the shoulders of that first stimulus. You give a third stimulus, it'll ride on the shoulders of that second stimulus and help to be able to reach a maximal tension point. Whenever you see it like this, these increasing waves, like greater and greater and greater wave increase until it reaches maximal tension, this is a specific type of contraction. We call this type, we call it incomplete or unfused tetanus.
okay? And incomplete or unfused tetanus is the more common. I'm gonna star that because that's important. This is the more common type of contractions that we exemplify in a regular day basis. Incomplete or unfused tetanus is a very sustained and quivering contraction. Okay, it's a sustained and quivering contraction. And it is the most common types of contractions that we exhibit on a daily basis. There is another type, but it is not as common. It doesn't happen in everyday life. Unless you, for, okay, so let me explain what this next one is. The next one is called complete tetanus. And the reason why this one doesn't happen on everyday life basis is because it requires very, very excessive and frequent stimuli. I'm talking like consistent. This one had a little bit of gaps in it. This one is consistent, one after another, after another, after another. And because of that, this is gonna be trying to lift extremely heavy loads. Like for example, you know how the, like the super moms, they lift a car off of a baby or something like that? That's the kind of activity that involves complete tetanus. And we don't do that every day. If we did that, our muscles would become fatigued very quickly. And what is that gonna do for us? So we need this type of complete tetanus to be very, very uh, utilized in situations where it requires excessive amounts of uh, energy and excessive amounts of strength and activity. So, for example, let's say that I take that same muscle fiber, but instead of me stimulating it, like, you know, at a, at a different, like, second, like, you know, for example, this was 10 to 30, so that was a 20 millisecond uh, time difference. This was 30 to 50, that was a 20 millisecond time difference. Let's say I do it one after another, after another, after another. I don't give any time breaks in between that. So let's say that I have here. Let's say I stimulate this muscle here. Okay, then I stimulate it here and I stimulate it here and I just keep doing that. I keep stimulating it at multiple points. And if I keep providing very, very frequent stimuli, look what happens. In the beginning, all you have here, okay, you'll have that latent phase, but then it's gonna start contracting. It's gonna start contracting, right? And you keep giving multiple, 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 multiple stimuli. So what's gonna happen in this muscle fiber? There's gonna be very, very frequent action potentials. Extreme amounts of calcium released into the sarcoplasm, um, I'm sorry, into the sarcoplasm. Extreme cross bridge formation and activation. Extreme contraction, which is gonna generate an insane amount of force. What does that mean then? Let's say again, here's maximal tension. Let's say we bring over here, maximal tension point. Okay, so this is the maximal tension. No matter how much more frequent stimuli you give, it's never gonna pass that point. It never can go beyond that tension point. So this is the maximal tension. So let's say that I reach, let's say I actually stimulate this so much. Let's say one, two, three, four. And I get to this fourth point. And I, by the fourth point, I reach that maximal tension. Okay, so one, two, three, four. By that fourth point, I reach the maximal tension. So this is stimuli one, Stimuli two, stimuli three, stimuli four, stimuli five, stimuli six. By the fourth one, I reach maximal tension, okay, during the contraction phase. But I keep giving stimuli even when it's at its maximal tension. Do I go beyond that? No. It stays at that point of maximal tension. Even though there's consistent and more frequent stimuli, it's not gonna change. It stays at that same maximal tension. You can't generate any more force. The muscle can't shorten any more than it already is. At that point, maximal tension is released and it starts plateauing. All of these, imagine it like this. Imagine all of these waves summating and fusing together, forming one complete wave instead of an incomplete wave. That's called complete tightness. So all of the waves fuse together and form a very sustained and very powerful and very smooth contraction. And this is going to look like this. It'll plateau and then eventually every muscle cell has to reach a point where it actually no longer can maintain that tension and it starts to relax. And then it goes back into its latent phase and waits for another stimulus. This right here, my friends, is called complete tetanus or fused tetanus. So it's called complete or fused tetanus. And again, like I said, it's not the more common one that we utilize on a daily basis, unless you're lifting up piano single-handedly every day, I am not. So more commonly, we're utilizing incomplete tetanus, where in certain situation, which is you need to, you can utilize complete or fused tetanus. But again, the reason why we don't utilize that as much is because it can easily fatigue our muscles very quickly. It's because it requires a lot of tension, a lot of energy, and a lot of very, very frequent stimuli. Okay, so that covers temporal wave summation, that covers maximal tension concept with the complete or fused tetanus, and we talked about maximal tension there.
Okay, so what we've done so far, guys, we talked about muscle twitch, you know, with the rapid contraction of the muscle, you know, from one neural stimulus. We talked about the graded muscle responses, but the only thing that we've really talked about so far is the frequency of the neural stimulus. What I'm going to do right now is we're going to stop this video and we're going to go into a second one. And in the second video, and what's going to be uh, muscle mechanics part two, we're going to talk now about the strength of the neural stimulus and how that affects muscle tension. And then we'll finish up by talking about motor unit and size principle recruitment. Okay, engineers, so I'll see you in a little.